Hello everyone, welcome to the conference Food uh, and Cultural Heritage and EU Policy Perspective, which is organized jointly between Europa Nostra and Slow Food. Thank you all for joining today's conference, where we will hear from a number of panelists about the link between food, culture and agriculture. My name is Madeleine Kost and I work for Slow Food Office in Brussels and I will be moderating the discussion today. So to start us off, I have a couple of technical details to note. So you will hear from several speakers and uh, we will have a question and answer at the end. You can pose questions uh, during the conference in the Q&A function that you find at the bottom left of your screen. You can also like other people's questions, uh, which you find the most interesting and they will go to the top and we will make sure that they get answered uh, during the conference or at the end during the Q&A session. Please only use the Q&A function to ask uh, specific questions. If you wish uh, to chat, to say hello, or to make comments, please use only the chat function. Um, if you use the chat function, make sure to um, click whether you want to share your message only with panelists or also with uh, the audience. So I will just do a very brief presentation as well of Slow Food and Europa Nostra, which are co-organizing this event. So Slow Food is an international grassroots movement that involves millions of people over 160 countries. It was founded 30 years ago to prevent the disappearance of local food cultures and traditions, and to make sure that everyone has access to food that is good for them, good for those who grow it, and good for the planet. Europa Nostra is the European voice of civil society committed to safeguarding and promoting cultural and natural heritage. It was born over 50 years ago and is now active in over 40 countries. Europa Nostra contributes to the development of heritage related policies and strategies in Europe and celebrates excellence and promotes best, best practices through the European Heritage Awards, Europa Nostra Awards in cooperation with the European Commission and campaigns to save Europe's most endangered monuments, sites, and landscapes. So to start, I will pass it on to my colleague, Paola Rovella, who will introduce why we are here today as part of the Food is Culture project. A warm welcome to all panelists and participants. Thank you very much for accepting our invitation to be here today and to join us. I'm Paola Rovella, I was low food, and it's really my pleasure to open the debate. Uh, let me only briefly introduce Food is Culture, uh, the project that allowed for uh, the development of the policy brief we are going to present today. Food is Culture is financed by the Creative Europe program in the framework of the European Year of Cultural Heritage 2018. Um, as I said, it is led by Slow Food and in partnership with uh, Europa Nostra and creative sector partners. Kinokus from Croatia, Nova Iskra Creative Hub from Serbia and Transpond AB from Sweden. Uh, let me also thank you Casa de Risparmio di Cuneo that is providing further co-financing. Food is much more than what we eat and food heritage encompasses products, people, biodiversity, landscape, traditions, and knowledge. It is the result of thousands of years of creativity and exchanges. It is precious and fragile. Industrial agriculture and the standardization of taste put it at risk every day. And when we lose food heritage, we do not only lose agrobiodiversity, but also century old savoir faire and bits of our cultural identity. So we are losing masterpieces, we are losing monuments. The project for this culture uh, includes three main activities to highlight the, the issues that I just uh, very quickly summarized. Um, the design of a multimedia artwork to showcase European food culture and uh, to highlight that we are running the risk to lose it. 
and uh, later uh, uh, Ivan and Josephine will uh, uh, illustrate uh, it at length. Uh, this exhibition was meant to travel to venues in all around Europe. Uh, originally, this meeting should have taken place at Bozar Center of Fine Arts in Brussels last March. But after the two first stops in Stockholm and Belgrade, we had to cancel the exhibitions planned in Brussels and in Italy due to COVID pandemics, first and second wave. So this is going to be Foodies Culture closing event. The project uh, also launched three contests to engage chefs, migrants, school children and their teachers uh, to share the stories about the food they cherish. And last but not least, the partnership wanted to put forward viable options to advance the protection of food cultural heritage in the EU agenda. And our recommendations are gathering the policy brief we are about to discuss. Thank you. Thank you very much, Paola, for this introduction to the Food of Culture project. Indeed, the pandemic has heavily impacted the exhibition, which is really a shame. Uh, but luckily, we're able to have a nice a panel discussion here online and actually reaching a much wider audience that would otherwise have been possible if we had had our conference in Brussels as initially planned. So now I pass it on to Manon Richard from Europe and Austria, who will introduce our panel of speakers for today. Good morning, everyone. And uh, thank you, Paola and Madeleine. Let me first say that Europa Nostra is very proud to be a partner of the Food is Culture project co-funded by the Creative Europe program of the European Union. On behalf of Europa Nostra, Slow Food and the other project partners, I wish to warmly welcome all participants who are following us today here and also via the live stream. We sadly cannot see you, but we are pleased that over 400 people from all over Europe and beyond have registered to be with us today. A very warm welcome also to our speakers. We are honored to have with us today representatives from the European Commission, the project partners, but also a young food heritage farmer. I will now briefly introduce each of them as we go through today's program. We will first hear about the exhibition, What You Didn't Know Existed, Endangered Food from Around the World which was produced in the frame of the Food Disculture project and traveled in a few cities across Europe. Food designer Josephine Vargo from Sweden is the creative mind behind it. And Ivan Manoslodvic, international cooperation manager at Nova Iskra in Belgrade, Serbia, will show us the online version of the exhibition. Secondly, Jimmy Jamar, who is now the head of the European Nostra office in Brussels, after having worked almost his entire career for the European Commission, will present the EU policy brief on food and cultural heritage that was recently published by Slow Food and Europa Nostra, and which you should all have received per email. These will surely provide food for thought to our panelists. Today, we will have the pleasure to hear from Branka Tome, Deputy Head of Unit at the European Commission's Directorate General for Agriculture and Rural Development. She's particularly, particularly responsible for the protection of geographical indications. Then we will hear from Anna Franziska Unter Guggenberger, a young farmer from Austria and member of the Lesartal Bright Slow Food Presidium. She's currently attending a secondary school for nutrition and agriculture. Then we will hear from Marta Mesa, the director of Slow Food Europe. She coordinates the development of the slow food movement and its activities in the region, also liaising with EU institutions on policies relating to food. And at last, we will hear from Pedro Velasquez. Deputy Head of the Creative Europe Unit at the European Commission's Directorate General for Education and Culture. is responsible for the implementation and management of the Creative Europe program and the preparation of the future program for the period 2021-2027.
Unfortunately, MEP Massimiliano Smeriglio apologized for not being able to be with us today due to the ongoing negotiations on the EU multiannual financial framework. This is of course important, so we wish him every success and we hope to welcome him again anytime soon. So in order to make this webinar as interactive as possible, you will see from time to time a poll question popping up on your screen. We have a few seconds to answer these and they will surely bring insights into the conversation. So for the first poll question, over to you, Madeleine. Okay, so everyone should he, uh, see on their screen the poll question that appears. So when you shop for food, does food culture and heritage come to mind? Yes, the cultural aspect of food is important to me. I have never really thought about it. Or C, no, I mainly think about taste and price. So we give you about 45 seconds to answer and we will see the results live. Unsurprisingly, but it's good to see that uh, most people do think about the cultural aspect of food. So this is a great start to our conversation uh, today. Um, now, we will hear from our first panelist, uh, Josephine Vargo, who is the designer of the online exhibit. Over to you, Josephine, you can share your screen now. Thank you so much, Madeleine and Manon. Um, it's great to be here. Uh, Hello everyone. Um, I'm going to share my screen here so you can see. Uh, I'm going to show you some images of what the actual in real life exhibition looks like. Um, so this is um, these are images from the first iteration of the exhibition, which was in Stockholm, uh, Sweden, at the Split Museum. And so basically this is an exhibition called What You Didn't Know Existed, Endangered Food from Around the World. And it's basically representing uh, food, food products um, and endangered uh, food products and, and uh, animal species that come from um, Slow Foods Arc of Taste uh, project, archive. Um, let's see. And so basically we had the, the design brief to design this touring exhibition um, platform that was supposed to be kind of a flat packed and then moved around to different uh, countries in Europe. So uh, we, and, but we wanted to kind of keep this sensorial aspect uh, to, to the um, exhibition. So it was a real challenge, but a really fun challenge. And so I think we managed to kind of create this interactive exhibition uh, that gave certain sensorial aspects, but also kind of became a very digital platform as well. And so basically the main idea behind this exhibition was this interactive table. Uh, and on the table, you would find eight different objects. And these objects are eight objects from the Ark of Taste archive. Um, and the, the Ark of Taste has over 5,000 objects. So there's, you know, so many different endangered foods uh, out there, unfortunately, um, but really unique products and unique stories and, um, and, and craftsmen and, and artisan people that are working with these very specific products. So what we wanted to uh, represent is like the wide uh, diversity that exists um, out there. So we chose these eight different products um, and created this interactive table where these objects kind of represented the products that we wanted to talk about uh, and to share their stories around. So the, the visitors could touch these metal uh, objects, which then triggered a film that would show the visitors around the table um, a little story uh, behind the, the products that we're making. So we had a lot of great uh, film material that Slow Food had. Um, so it was about maybe a few minutes uh, long films for each of these products. And we will also represent where they're coming from and give short stories. We had also a, a sound designer that uh, we, we could read the text, but the sound kind of created this ambience within the space to kind of get people to gather around the table together and watch these films uh, in a group, basically. 
Um, so we had these eight different uh, films that people could interact with and constantly kind of touch these uh, objects. Uh, the idea was also that the exhibition would go to Croatia where it would be shown at a film uh, festival. Uh, so we had the opportunity to kind of use this film screening um, part module uh, to show films, but it was also uh, kind of acting as a backdrop um, to kind of trigger people to come in and dare to go into the, the table. Uh, we also had uh, touch screens uh, where people could explore and read more about the Arc of Taste on Slow Foods website. Uh, and then we designed a unique uh, touchscreen where we chose basically 50 uh, other products from the Arc of Taste uh, in, within Europe, because it was going to be shown in, in Europe, this exhibition, uh, where you could also get a more of an image-based um, kind of representation of the products, but also read a little bit more ab about them. Uh, and then the, the guests could also print a recipe that was connected to this, to this um, product. And this was one way of also kind of giving the visitors something to, to get back after the exhibition and to give some kind of sensorial interactive aspect to it. Um, yeah, that's what I have for you. And I'll pass it on to Ivan, who will talk more about uh, the online presence of uh, the exhibition. Thank you so much. Yeah, uh, thanks to Josephine. Thank you. Yeah, we also, uh, during the course of the project, we, um, uh, one of the activities and one of the goals was uh, to uh, actually make an online version of the artwork. And uh, this was also not an easy task because in a way we didn't want to replicate the experience that we had in the physical uh, exhibition in the artwork. So we wanted to create a unique experience, which is uh, it, uh, which will be online only and uh, true to its nature. So I will just now share my screen. I hope you see it. So uh, one of uh, one of, actually uh, one of the ideas was, uh, of course, to integrate the values of the project itself in the uh, uh, in the uh, online version uh, and of course one of these uh, uh, values were that uh, an online version should reflect the core goals of the artwork uh, should raise should raise awareness of the cultural value of uh, food biodiversity uh, the arc of taste catalog uh, should be in the heart of the project as same as a, as a physical exhibition and uh, we wanted also to integrate uh, participation of the communities in preserving the food heritage. This is something that was also, and it will be mentioned later, uh, this is something that was also in activities uh, uh, during the course of the exhibition. And uh, one of the most important elements were, of course, uh, to teach younger generations about the necessities of uh, preserving the local food stories. Uh, so in, uh, in doing this, we set uh, five goals with the online exhibition uh, and uh, mainly these goals were that uh, 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 visitors should uh, get to know about the four main topics that were developed by the methodology in the school context and the education for schools. Uh, that also we wanted to promote the project during its implementation and uh, after its completion so so to be like a, a, a tool for uh, uh, distribution of the activities uh, and we also wanted to be like a resource hub for educational tools uh, that could be uh, used by schools uh, even after the completion of the uh, project um, and of course, as I mentioned before, we wanted to make a unique online experience. Uh, so uh, in doing this, we set the uh, main function of the art online artwork uh, to be educational and presentational. Uh, we somehow defined that the visitors are coming from the project partners' websites and also social networks. Uh, we wanted to, that visitors are coming usually uh, uh, already interested in, uh, in the topics uh, mentioned in the uh, online uh, version and the project itself. Uh, and uh, uh, we defined visitors to be uh, wanted to know more after uh, seeing the artwork exhibition, the physical uh, artwork. 
So, uh, and also uh, uh, we define that the, uh, our visitors are also teachers and educators who want to find resources uh, uh, in order to uh, pass this subject with their students. Uh, so uh, this uh, somehow defined the whole process, how we uh, 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 later on um, uh, uh, design the web pages and the, the whole online experience. So uh, uh, it was already, it was uh, in the beginning, uh, it was clear that the a landing page should be like a, a, a one page website experience that uh, you just scroll down and then you see these uh, four main topics defined in, in, in the education material, which would be biodiversity, clean food, uh, culture and, and taste. Uh, uh, so also we wanted to engage more with the visitors by uh, defining a video as a, as a prime medium. Uh, so uh, somehow the website starts with the uh, uh, initial video that you can see on, on the very beginning uh, is the video from the Stockholm exhibition, uh, which should give sense of the results made in the project in a way, but also should uh, uh, show how uh, uh, this uh, great exhibition in Artworks was accepted uh, and uh, because you know the show, uh, uh, Stockholm uh, exhibition had a lot of visitors and and the opening and later on. Uh, so uh, one of the core and main uh, parts of the uh, online exhibition is the map, uh, something that you already saw and uh, uh, Josephine mentioned. Uh, now we want to redefine this map and uh, we didn't replicate it with the uh, uh, recipes from the Ark of Taste, but rather we wanted to show uh, recipes collecting uh, by the visitors and uh, a citizen contest uh, during the uh, uh, course of the project. Uh, so, uh, uh, in a way, this map is a result of uh, collaborative actions uh, with different users and stakeholders of the project. And of course, uh, as in the physical exhibition, uh, visitors can also uh, print recipes or uh, uh, rather download them as, as PDFs. Um, I will just uh, also show briefly uh, some other parts of the uh, online artwork. Uh, one would be uh, chef menus. Uh, this, is, this was also an important activity during the course of the project. So we want to embed them in the on online artwork so uh, uh, this part of the artwork shows uh, stories from the food heritage without, uh, with, within every recipe, which is an important part. And also uh, uh, in total, we have uh, 46 uh, uh, recipes and 46 chefs from uh, all around Europe. Uh, school contest is important also activities during the course of the project. And uh, we wanted somehow, uh, as I said, that this uh, online artwork should be also an educational hub uh, for uh, additional activities with school children. Uh, so we made available that all material gathered and uh, made and produced during the course of the project is available on the website in four languages. Uh, uh, they're uh, ready to be used uh, for, for trainers and teachers uh, uh, anytime uh, they wish, and they uh, they uh, they don't actually uh, require any additional trainers to be performed in schools. Uh, uh, also, an important part of the online uh, artwork is uh, food tales uh, from diaspora. Uh, this was also, as you uh, can guess, an important part of the uh, activities of the project. Uh, so, uh, Seven Food Tales reflects not only different recipes, uh, but also uh, tells stories about uh, migrant cultures. And we wanted to uh, emphasize that uh, migrant culture is an, also an integral part of the European cultures. And uh, uh, basically this is it. So, uh, this is the link and, uh, for the website. Uh, so, uh, you will surely get it in, maybe in the, in the chat. So, uh, you can later on uh, visit them as, as you can. Thank you so, so much, uh, Ivan and, and Josephine. Yes, thank, thank you so much. Thank you also for sharing the link. I see that Yael, uh, my colleague uh, from Slow Food, has also shared the link to the exhibition, so you are able to, to see it there. 
Um, so thank you both for bringing the exhibition to us. Um, we also uh, invite you to go to the website and to check out and discover the many products that Slow Food has included uh, as well in the Arc of Taste. Uh, the Arc of Taste, um, for those of you who don't know it, is a Slow Food project and it is an online catalog of foods at risk of disappearing that are part of the cultures and traditions of the entire world. Today, we are experiencing a standardization of our food supply chains and of our food production in general, which means that over the last 60 years, thousands of species, breeds, and varieties selected by humans, as well as processed foods, such as uh, breads, cheeses, and sweets, and the related know-how, which constitute our food heritage, have disappeared. So Europa Nostra and Slow Food have recently published a joint policy brief on this question. How can the European Union better protect food heritage? And indeed, the links between food and culture are too often overlooked in policy making, although the production and consumption of food are really strongly influenced by our cultural environment. So now I invite Jimmy Jamar from Europa Nostra to present some of the main points of this policy brief, which you can also find online on the exhibition's website. I think it's in the About section. And uh, we can also post the link towards the policy brief or the executive summary at the end of the conference. Jimmy, I leave it to you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Good morning, um, everybody. I'm very pleased and very honored um, to take part in this, uh, in this important conference. I'm not going to uh, go through because this would be, and you can read the, the policy brief, etc. But I would like to uh, um, say a few words, maybe a few personal words about as an outsider, because I joined Europa Nostra not very long ago, how I um, uh, sort of integrate into this, uh, into this project and some of the lessons I have, uh, I have learned. And I will start maybe by saying something that might seem a bit provocative, because when I joined uh, Europa Nostra over, just over a year ago, and I met uh, with Manon, I saw, started uh, knowing about this specific project. And I was a bit um, bewildered in the beginning, or surprised, uh, to see a project uh, uh, under the name uh, Food is Culture. Because for me, this seemed totally uh, evidence. I mean, that food is, uh, food is, uh, is, is heritage. And yet, I mean, the simple fact that we have this, uh, th that we had this project and that we have this, uh, this conference today shows that uh, we still have a lot of work to do uh, in bringing this idea and joining these two issues of uh, heritage and, and, and food as, I would say, something more uh, transversal in defining uh, policies at EU level. It's interesting because this morning, uh, just before coming here, I attended another closing ceremony for another project supported by the EU that was called Heritage for Rural Regeneration. And I think it's interesting because it fits actually very well into the things that we are talking about um, uh, today. Now, I worked in the European Commission for 30 years and in trying to understand why we still have this sort of uh, mismatch, or not mismatch, but that these this combination is not self-evident and the importance of heritage in general. Um, I remember, I mean, the way we operate, and this is also the case in the institutions, it's also the case at the member state level. When you talk about food, well, uh, you are directed to a specific uh, commission or parliament service. Uh, when you talk about heritage, you are uh, directed toward other services. Um, and it's very difficult from there to grasp, I would say, a more global narrative that stresses, I would say, the importance uh, of heritage in general and of food heritage more particularly. And I think it's, it's very important to change this narrative now uh, and this conference and this project particularly help to do so. Because if you think about, about it and you look at every, every uh, political priority of the Commission, of the of the, the parliament, of the other institutions, or the national uh, priorities, you find that actually heritage has a very strong uh, component in every one of these priorities. Of course, there's climate change. Climate change has, for the heritage world, some very dramatic components in the, the very survival of a number of cities. But it's also linked, of course, 
to the protection of our oceans, to the protection of our coasts, to the protection of our uh, rural areas, of our green areas, of our forests. This is what we, this is heritage. And this is for the link between food and heritage, for food uh, heritage. This is, of course, something absolutely uh, essential that we address, of course, uh, this issue. This deal amongst the priorities, you have the digital challenge. And of course, here also, during the pandemic particularly, we have seen a lot of uh, work done on the whole issue of digitalization in the area of heritage. There's, of course, the whole issue of jobs linked to also uh, social inclusion and local development. And it's important to, to make people understand that we are talking here, if we put all of our areas together, we are talking about a significant amount of jobs. Some are very, in fact, in the, in the heritage world, some very specialized types of job. But this is also something uh, very important. And then you have tourism, of course, which is also one of our priorities. Maybe one of the virtuous, the only virtuous elements of the pandemic is that this has forced us to slow down a bit this, um, um, this catastrophe we're going with, I would say, our, our tourism policies in the EU and controlled policies with some very detrimental con consequences to many uh, touristical areas. And this is very much linked, once again, with the area that you are carrying, is the food area. 50% um, of tourism in the EU is linked to cultural tourism. And 50%, of course, is linked also to the whole issue of gastronomy heritage, food heritage. People come there also for, come to us also for these reasons. So this obliges us to reconsider, I would say, the whole issue of our links to of our tourism policy, of our tourism patterns. It forces us um, uh, to look into issues, bringing in fully the, the issues of sustainability, of biodiversity, and so on. This is absolutely essential. And then there are two other issues that I think that we have to just mention. The one is something that came out very strongly during the pandemic, uh, when you talk to people, and that is the issue of well-being. Now, we are not there yet at the more global narrative about this. But one thing that came out very strongly is that people are looking, are expressing the wish to, for a, a better and a more self-controlled uh, life and life patterns. And there is something, if you're talking about well-being, well, naturally, of course, the whole issue of heritage comes very much to the forefront. And the whole issue, of course, of food heritage and gastronomy comes very much to the forefront, you have seen this during uh, this pandemic and during uh, the confinement. And the second element is that next year, we, there's going to be a, a conference, a large conference Europe-wide on the future of Europe. Now, this, this conference will have um, a strong decentralized element. And they will call on associations, citizens, uh, people working in specific areas, to express the views about the, the way they want to see the future um, of Europe. And, and Europa Nostra, we will be very strongly involved in this, and we will certainly get back to all of you to, uh, to have you, your views, because this is something that we have to say. But if you think about it, what brings people together now? What links the Europeans if you, if you, uh, today? It's the whole issue also of heritage. And there again, the food issue is something that brings also people together. To interest, I'd just like to, to refer, and this shows also that, that we have some work to do. We have seen very little about this. This shows that it has not reached yet, I would say, the upper level where we design our global EU policies. Um, I have listened, of course, to the president of the commission in the State of the Union speak, I've looked at uh, the work program for the Commission for 2020. Just, uh, there's no, in the work program, no mention about heritage uh, in general. And this is something that we, or we see that we have work to do. One element did come out as an example was a reference to what uh, Ursula von der Leyen called a new Bauhaus. This Bauhaus, is, which is a project that will link uh, architects, designers, students, uh, and um, and local authorities together to produce, I would say, a sort of new work together to produce a new architectural model uh, where we integrate very strongly 
the issues of innovation and of climate change. But there's no word in, I would say, the first uh, work on this. Uh, there's no link uh, to the issue of heritage. And when you think about it, Bauhaus in itself is a heritage word. A word. And on the other hand, uh, where are we going to create these architectural model in places where you have heritage? And heritage is all over the place in Europe. And what was interesting also, when I listened to uh, the, the, this project, and one of the essences being bringing people together to work on a project for the future. But what do we do in the heritage world? That's what we do every day. In your area, on the food area, when you do something, uh, any project to defend the brands, to defend uh, biodiversity, etc., you have to bring the people together. You have to bring the farmers and the consumers and the local organizations and the public authorities. We are doing that all the time. So we have something really fundamental to bring in to this debate. The commission, when they created now uh, the, the, the new functions, they devoted, I would say, the, 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 one of the vice presidencies, a good friend of mine, of, um, to the vice president for promoting the European way of life. But this is where we have to act all together because the European way of life is actually what we are talking about today. So in this uh, brief that you, that you will see, but it also matches a lot of the conclusions of the study of the European Investment Bank Food for Change because we are not working and we should not work on all of this together. We have to join forces for this. And we have two recommendations particularly that we have put forward in this brief is to fully recognize the value of food heritage as a transversal sector. And on the other hand, to set up participatory and multi-stakeholder governments for food heritage. Food heritage is sometimes, heritage is sometimes considered by people in their minds is something that concerns the past. But heritage is not something that concerns the past. Heritage is something that's holistic, that's transversal, that concerns all of us. And it's something that doesn't concern the past, it concerns our future. It's on the basis of the heritage that we have that we can design the future. And this is, I think, the message that we can all share. So thank you very much for all of your work, and uh, I th which is essential because you touch on one of the most essential uh, uh, areas in this, in this respect, something that is shared. Uh, but we all have to, all together, carry this project further into make, I would say, uh, heritage not just a sector in the development of commis uh, commission or other policies, but as a driving force for shaping Europe's future. Thank you. Thank you so much, Jimmy, for, for this presentation. And thank you for stressing also, uh, pointing out the, the problem that we have, uh, that often policies are being made in silos separately and for making so clear as well that this link between food and cultural heritage. Uh, you also pointed to something very important that we'll also discuss a little bit later, which is uh, highlighting the struggles of the creative and tourist sector and also the food and agricultural sector during uh, this pandemic. Of course, these issues are, are very linked. Um, now, before we go to our next speaker, Branka Tome, we have a second poll question for all of you. So can we have the second question? Okay. Would you say that the EU, so the European Union, is doing enough to protect our food heritage? Yes, no, or I don't know. We all have about 20 seconds left to answer. Okay, what are the results? No, the EU is not doing enough to protect food heritage. Well, this is a great start to our next panelist as we will have two people from the European Commission who can explain a little bit uh, in detail what the European Commission is uh, doing uh, to protect food heritage. Of course, uh, the European Commission is not fully responsible for everything that happens in the EU. Let's keep that in mind. Um, but here, uh, let me... Um, pass on the microphone to Branka Tome uh, from the European Commission, Director General of Agriculture and Rural Development, 
uh, to speak about specifically what is DG Agri doing to protect food heritage and what it plans to do to strengthen it. Over to you, Branka. Many thanks, Madeleine. I will um, try to share my uh, presentation. I hope you can uh, see it. Uh, I will try to make it uh, a slide. Yes, we, we yeah. see your screen. There we go. So uh, thank you very much for this invitation. And uh, you are asking the questions uh, on the screen. I will ask you also a question and I will ask you, what did you have for breakfast today? Did you have any of the products with the story? The story of people who make these products who are uh, living in a, and working in a particular area, in a region, and they uh, know that area well, they're able to bring in their products uh, the best from the environment, the best of the nature that they're living in, and the best of their skills and their knowledge. These are products with a story. And in the European Union, we are protecting the names of such products and we call them geographical indications. So these are the names of the products where there is a special link to the place of production, special link to the people who are living there, who are putting their love and care into what they're producing. And at the EU level, we have almost 100, uh, 1,500 such names registered. You can see a few, a few photos uh, here. And uh, these um, names are then protected, which means that only those who are living in that particular region and who are respecting the product specification that has been drafted by them, only those people can uh, use these names. And we are protecting the, these names in all European member states. And we are negotiating agreements with third countries so that also around the world, uh, these names uh, would be protected. Uh, meaning that uh, they can, the, such products cannot be produced there. They can only be produced in the specific region of production. And geographical indications, in fact, are an important uh, uh, food uh, and drink sector. Here I have mentioned 1,500 names. These are only food names. We are protecting also about 1,600 1, um, wine names and about 240 spirit drinks names. And all this together represents about 7% of all food and drinks that European Union is producing. And uh, in exports, it is about 15% of everything uh, that European Union is exporting in food and drinks. And uh, these geographical indications, in fact, they are intellectual property rights. So the producers who do them they get their rights, the right to produce the product under that name, meaning the others cannot produce it. And such uh, geographical indications, they guarantee authenticity because there is a product specification behind it, because the products have to be produced in the geographical area. And there are also the logos so that um, um, consumers can recognize such products. And uh, these are local products, but uh, they are protected uh, in, in the global market. And uh, geographical indications are our heritage, our cultural heritage, our food heritage. I have here a few examples. For example, Geil Thaler Alenkese. It's an Austrian cheese. It dates back to the fourth century. 
it's produced in a small alpine um, valley in, um, in Austria. And uh, it, it ensured the survival of the product and of the people there. Uh, and it's uh, um, so the cows are on mountain pastures and the milk is produced in, in alpine pastures. Beurre d'Isigny, it's a butter, butter from France, from a French region and uh, produced by traditional methods and uh, it contributes to survival of a special uh, cow breed from uh, Normandy. Pache Casseau, it's a Croatian uh, product, it's a salt and uh, it uh, has a very strong uh, uh, heritage from the point of view that there are special techniques, special know-how, how to maintain the salt pools, how to ensure that uh, um, the, the flower of this salt is harvested at the best moment uh, in order to, to ensure, the, ensure the quality and to protect the, the traditions. I recall the coastal nodery. Uh, this is in fact an application now. It's not yet a protected product. We received an application, so we will be protecting it soon. And uh, it's, a it's, a, it's a famous uh, for entering into one of the famous uh, French dishes, le cassoulet. Retsina. Retsina is a Greek uh, wine. It has a history of more than 2000 years and uh, it has a particular flavor because uh, it is sealed. Uh, so the wine vessels are sealed with natural raisin, which is extracted from a pine tree uh, in, um, in Greece. Balaton, Balatoni, wine, Hungarian wine. It was in uh, medieval history that uh, churches and monasteries, they were developing viticulture and viniculture. And uh, the wine uh, has survived. And uh, today it makes uh, an inter integral part of the tourism on uh, Lake Balaton. And uh, last example, uh, one spirit drink, Trinkische Zwitschgenwasser. It's a German, uh, German spirit from uh, Quetches, special type of plums. And um, um, there is a special traditional way of processing these uh, Quetches. Uh, and uh, it, it, uh, it uh, stayed alive, this traditional way, and it helped also to preserve small scale farming. So um, to, to to keep alive uh, the small producers of this uh, type of plums. But we don't have only geographical indications. We also have traditional specialties guaranteed. These uh, do not refer to a particular geographical area, but these are the names of the products where there is a traditional recipe or where there is a traditional production method. In comparison to geographical indications, they seem to be less popular because uh, only 64 names are registered. Uh, and uh, this is why we have started now reflections uh, on how to better promote European traditional uh, products. So for those that are produced in specific geographical areas that we see it's uh, quite a success but uh, for uh, traditional products uh, which are not produced in a specific geographical area but can be produced in several areas we have to find maybe better ways um, because we know that there are traditional uh, many many products done by traditional recipe and traditional method and okay, i'm so sorry to interrupt you but maybe could you wrap up in one minute of course Thank Finally, you. we also have mountain product. Mountain product is also a reserved, a reserved. Not everybody can write mountain product on its product, but only those producers who are producing in mountain areas and who use raw material and who process in mountain areas. 
So I have already mentioned that we have started reflections on how can we better protect traditional names. And uh, in fact, it was the commission president, uh, Mrs. von der Leyen, who said that we should look at ways to strengthen the system of geographical indications that our cultural, gastronomic, and local heritage will be preserved. We also uh, have uh, the importance of this in farm to fork strategy, which uh, has uh, underlined uh, the need to strengthen what already exists. And uh, this is why we have started to look at how we can revise the schemes. Uh, and uh, uh, from, from on this basis, we have started policy evaluation. We will have a geographical indications conference next week. And uh, this will be then followed by public consultation. So I can already invite everybody now to answer to our public consultation when it will be published. And we have already published the roadmap for our works. So uh, have your say. Please do go into this link, take a look what we are uh, aiming to do in the next uh, months. Uh, and um, please help us. Please help us to improve our policy together. My last sentence is about vision for rural areas. It's not my unit who is dealing with this, but I was asked by my colleagues if I can also tell you that there is currently public consultation ongoing about the vision for rural areas. This is because my colleagues want to launch a debate uh, how to address the pressing issues for rural areas like uh, demographic change, like connectivity, like risk of poverty, like risk of limited, uh, like existence of limited access to services. And uh, also here, the public consultation is published. Uh, and uh, this is my second invitation for all of you to reply because your replies, your contributions, they help us a lot in reflection, in analyzing, in understanding what's happening on the ground with a view to improve our policies. So I would like to thank you all. And uh, one more invitation, please do visit our web pages. We have more stories about geographical indications there. And there is also the official register of all uh, the names that are registered and protected. Many thanks. Thank you very much, Franca, for this great uh, overview and for showing all of these pictures. Uh, geographical indications are indeed a very important to policy topic for slow food, and so we will definitely be participating uh, in the conference and in the consultation. And thank you for this invitation for the wider public as well to um, participate in, in these processes. It's very important that we can all uh, share our views as well. Uh, so now, before we go on with Anna Francisca, we have a Third poll question, when you travel, how much does food heritage influence your choice of destination? I spend hours researching typical and traditional foods before arriving. All I need is for the food to be tasty and of good quality, or food is not an important factor in my travel plans. I have 20 more seconds to answer. All right, what are the results? Again, unsurprisingly, most of us do spend hours and hours researching typical and traditional foods before arriving. So this is also a great transition uh, to you, Anna Francisca, uh, as I think you will also be uh, mentioning the importance of food heritage in uh, tourism as well. I pass it on to you, and I just want to remind all of the speakers to try to be a little bit shorter, uh, just seven minutes, so that we have uh, time for reactions and also a good question and answer uh, with the audience. Over to you, Anna. Thank you. Yes, a first 
I want to say thank you for giving us the opportunity to give a short presentation on the Lesartel bread. This is really highly appreciated. And so I will share the screen now. So. Well, my name is Anna Franziska Unterguckenberger. I am 19 years old and I'm attending the final year of the College for Agriculture and Nutrition Science in Klagenfurt. I grew up in a small farm in the Lesachtal Valley. The Lesachtal is located in the southwest of Carinthia and borders Tyrol in the west and Italy in the south. It is a remote valley that used to be difficult to reach and leave throughout the trenches. Therefore, the population lived relatively self-supporting until the modern age and manufactured the majority of their products themselves. The Lesachtel bread was the most important food here through the centuries. This bread was and is still a staple food in our valley, which is eaten as a side dish with many dishes. The grains for the bread are produced by the local farms here. And the bread consists of two third ray flour and one third wheat flour. With the addition of water and salt and spices, sourdough and a little yeast for fermentation purpose. Everything is baked into a round loaf of bread. The basic criteria for uh, a bread uh, to be called the Lesachtel bread are whenever it is possible, ray and wheat should be produced uh, and grown in our valley. Uh, sourdough is used to be the main leavening agent and all production steps must take place in our valley and are restricted to the farms here. The association community of Lesachtel Bread was found in 2017. It has 20 members, uh, includes 15 bread bakers and five grain producers. If you're interested, you can also look up on our website uh, but I would like to apologize for the fact that this website is only in German so far. In 2018, the Lesachtel bread was declared a Prosidi product by Slow Food International. This means that the Slow Food International Commission has declared that this product is particularly worthy of protection. This bread is baked according to the same schema as it was back then. The own grain baked with sourdough and traditional skills makes this bread something very, very special. And it is precisely this tradition that we want to maintain, but we also want to pass on our knowledge of the Lesachtel bread to tourists and other interested people. Today's tourists are looking for a down-to-earth attitude, time and peace. These reasons are given by the tradition and the slow production process of the Lesachtel bread. Only the work technique has changed from the past. The small farms have kept the tradition to this day. After the Second World War, food increasingly became an industrial product. As a result, many traditional foods, such as the Lesachtel bread, are endangered in their existence. Some of these products are also copied by industry and trade. This undermines traditional food and its value is lost. This costs many farmers their existence. The uniqueness of a region is also lost, which in turn has a major impact on tourism. As a result, not only the diversity in cultural landscape is lost, but also the variety in food. For us, it is inevitable 
that if we want to protect this valley and its culture and food heritage, we have to protect the Lesothil bread. A region as small as the Lesothil Valley is not likely able to achieve this object on its own. We have no lobbyists like industry uh, and trade or even the big agriculture. That is why we need help to implement such, uh, such protection and promotion. We would like to implement a regional development initiative to support the small farmers and bread producers in protecting this heritage and marketing. It is important that we do this together with the producers themselves rather than with an official professional representation. Perhaps this could be incorporated into, into the CAP, the Common Agriculture Policy Program for the coming years. The demand for our unique product is potentially large and offers a chance to revive the Lesothal Valley and to meet the population's desire for sustainability and promotion of this authentic product. Especially the current Corona crisis also shows the benefits of independence in food supply. Thank you. Thank you so much, Anna Francisca, for this great presentation. Uh, it was really wonderful to see the, the process of the bread making and uh, also this short chain between the wheat grown in the valley and the sourdough that, uh, bread that you make from it. Uh, I don't think I'm the only one in the audience uh, to have tried to bake sourdough bread during the confinement. Apparently, there's really a trend that exploded. Um, it's not surprising. There's really something special about making sourdough bread in the making and also uh, in the taste. So thanks for sharing this. And you also mentioned the common agricultural policy, which is uh, for us one of the main policies that Slow Food is monitoring and we see as a very important tool for change uh, and improvements to be made uh, in protecting food heritage. So now I pass it on to Marta Mesa, the director of Slow Food uh, Europe. Thank you so much, Madeleine, and uh, hello, everyone. Very pleased to be here uh, with you right now. And uh, I'm very pleased to speak, uh, especially after Anne Francisca, and I think your presentation connects very nicely the dots. Madeleine already mentioned how bread for many people all of a sudden became something very interesting, but Anne Francisca, you explained very well how much knowledge and biodiversity goes into the whole process. And here by biodiversity, when we as Low Food talk about biodiversity, we mean the biodiversity of the grains, for instance, like you and Francisca were saying, but of the cultivated uh, varieties of the farm breeds, uh, but we also mean the biodiversity of bacteria, those in soil, but also so those in the sourdough, for instance, or all those bacteria that are responsible for fermentation. And certainly within biodiversity, we also include the biodiversity, the diversity of knowledge and know-how. And this connects to one of the questions that was asked in the uh, questions and answers section, by the way, thank you for all the questions already there, which is indeed the connection between food and culture and nature. And it is, in our view, absolutely important. It is uh, strictly connected with one another. And again, and Francisca like, gave us a great introduction and a great example into this. It's really about how um, we as human beings interact with nature, with our landscape, how we preserve it, and by the way, landscapes are also, are also part of our cultural heritage, how we preserve it, how we enrich it through an interaction where we continuously, if you want, learn from one another. Um, so nature is an absolutely fundamental element of culture, um, and precisely because of the, of the importance of, of the biodiversity that is unique to each region in this world. Um, and also nature, uh, it's, uh, it, and culture are particularly important in terms of the sustainability of this food system that we want to have. And uh, Jimmy mentioned it and also Anne Francisca, but you know, the COVID pandemic has shown an um, absolutely a, a huge range of challenges, but it also shown a huge outburst in initiatives where communities have come together. So 
groups of people have come together at local level to try to make sure that everybody, especially also the most vulnerable people in, in societies would have access to good food, not just any food, but to good food, and to make sure that farmers and artisan producers could keep selling their products and keep up their businesses. Um, so it's also this aspect of, you know, recognizing the value of the of what nature offers of what human know-how contributes in making turning this natural raw ingredients into something that is an amazing final product and in this sense um, i just want to focus on two aspects um, of the of the green deal and specifically of the farm to fork strategy which is one part of the of the green deal that has been mentioned during this uh, conversation the farm to fork strategy was published back in may we as low food and many other partner organizations were quite happy with what was published there um, of course we were hoping for even higher ambitions but of, already the fact that there was much uh, clearer and open talk about food systems and sustainability was a step in the right direction um, there are still concerns and this is, refers to another question uh, that was asked uh, still concerns about the uh, threat of new GMOs, the so-called new breeding technologies, um, but specifically with reference to geographical indications, um, like we know that uh, the, the farm to fork strategy about that says where, um, where appropriate introduce sustainability criteria. In that sense, we would actually want the sustainability criteria to be there and not just where appropriate. And why is this? Because uh, and we've been exchanging in this, we've, we've been discussing this already in past conversations with Branka Tome, who I'm very happy she could join us today. Um, at the moment, uh, in some cases, geographical indications are not um, supporting the most sustainable productions. Just to give an example, uh, when it comes to cheese production, um, there is no uh, baseline or criteria about the kind of milk that is used. We have a specific example within the Slow Food Network, the Stilton cheese. It's a, it has a geographical indication. However, um, the producers that came together to um, apply for the geographical indication uh, brought in the uh, regulation that it would be produced with pasteurized uh, milk, which excludes the one producer who's still producing it with raw milk. And raw milk, again, and this would be a whole big chap a chapter, but raw milk is strictly connected then to animal welfare, to what the cows are being fed, to how the cows are being treated, and again, to the sustainability I was mentioning before, the connection with nature, with biodiversity, with, with the nature that works with us, that we work with. Um, so this is an invitation to say, let's grasp the opportunity of the farm to fork to push for even higher um, sustainability ambitions. And just one last final remark, uh, and you mentioned it, Francisca, and Francisca, the common agricultural policy. Uh, we're in, right now in a phase where our national governments, the European Commission, and um, the members of the European Parliament are negotiating um, the, the proposal for the common agricultural policy. We as civil society have huge concerns because um, it's going um, the way it looks right now due to the last votings that happened in the parliament and in the council or discussions rather in the council are pushing the common agricultural policy to be even less ambitious. It's already not ambitious right now, but it would, they're pushing it even lower than it is right now. Um, and we've been calling actually for the CAP to be withdrawn. Um, but it's absolutely fundamental that also this policy that uses the largest share of the budget of the European Union really makes a big push towards greater sustainability. I'll stop here and thank you everyone. Thank you, Martha. Uh, of course, the link with the EU Green Deal is especially important right now and thanks for highlighting it. Um, and also on the need for a bit more coherence between the food and cultural and agricultural policies and the CAP, as you, as you mentioned. Um, so now we will hear from our final speaker, Pedro Velasquez, from the Director General on Education, Youth, Sport and Culture, about what they are doing also to, to promote food heritage. I leave it to you. Mute. Okay, can you hear me? Yes. So, good morning or good afternoon now. Um, I heard that food is culture, that food is agriculture. No surprise, I mean, it's all the same word. It all comes from the same word in Latin. So, 
it's uh, but thought is also a lot of things is uh, research is tourism is innovation uh, there are plenty of departments on the european commission dealing with uh, food and uh, food is also heritage and this is the uh, the part uh, uh, that um, our program culture a creative europe deals with the the cultural heritage and uh, in this case of course uh, food is part of it um, i will go and give you a few details about uh, the novelties of the program and the uh, good news about uh, the future program meanwhile perhaps let me refer very very briefly to the to the crisis we are we are experiencing in, um, since uh, March, which has hit very hard the cultural sector, and uh, more often, most often, and very rightly, uh, citizens when they think about a crisis in culture, they think about uh, performing arts, uh, about uh, concerts, about the theaters, etc., etc., etc. It's, they don't necessarily think about uh, food heritage uh, and heritage as such. And heritage has also been um, very hardly hit. Let's think about museums or the visits have been reduced to, to, to zero in many, in many countries. But in, this, in, the, in, the, in the sector that, um, that uh, concerns us now, um, it is very important and because um, we all think that food has been working, the food chain and food production have been working during these months. And this is true, we have been able to eat during all these, uh, all these um, months. But it is true also that, I mean, a lot of um, restaurants, we are more in, in charge of the creative part of food uh, or the more creative uh, part of preparing food has uh, have closed. And very often, uh, many of those gastronomic restaurants are the ones that are kind of using many of the products that we have been seeing now. Sometimes they have uh, saved some products that were forgotten and thanks to this restaurant they, they ensure a, a value chain for, for these products. So I know that the value chain has been broken, broken in the sector of food and this is particularly hitting very hard uh, um, the sector. And this is something that I believe it's worth to, to be noticed here. Um, of course, I mean, um, there are a lot of uh, measures that have been taken during the COVID crisis in our sector, in the cultural sector, to, to, to cope with the crisis and to help the sector. Uh, I will not go through all of them. I will mention uh, perhaps uh, the, 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 the Erasmus call of 100 million, which is huge when we think that the cooperation project this year in Creative Europe was 50 million. So there has been a duplication of funds I mean, to help the creative sectors in connection this time with education, which for this particular sector, I believe has a special, a special meaning as well. Uh, tourism has always been, um, has always been uh, uh, an area of particular attention. Uh, let's think that uh, according to statistics, 40% of all tourism is related to heritage. 40% of all tourism. When the tourist sector has virtually stopped, I mean, the heritage sector has really suffered about that. I mean, there, are, there is a commission recovery plan covering, I mean, with all the details that you, most of, most of you know, and I will not go into details because I need to sell my book today here in this program. And uh, my book is the Creative Europe program. And uh, just to remind you that um, um, the Creative Europe program um, has two main objectives. And to put it in a very simple terms with no jargon, one is to protect the cultural diversity in every corner of Europe. And uh, the second is to help to the economies of the cultural and creative sector. And as I said uh, previously, when we talk about culture and creative sectors, a lot of people often don't think about heritage, but heritage and creativity and are, are, are very strongly connected. And this is the way we approach it in the, in the program that try to implement 
uh, most of the indications uh, from the policy aspect that Jimmy had mentioned before. This is why I'm not going to, to go through all this policy aspect, but just let me um, remind one important thing about the new Creative Europe program is that it will for the first time be directly connected to and implemented with the new agenda of culture. There is a perfect connection on between policy and the program. So the program Creative Europe is the arm to implement our policy objectives. Um, we are talking about a new program and those, for those that are less familiar with our business is uh, the new program that will start in 2021 to cover the period 2021-2027. It will be, it will keep the same name, Creative Europe, and it will keep the same objectives, as I mentioned, one, diversity, second, uh, pro promote the economy of the sector. The good news I mentioned previously um, are about the budget. Thanks to the work of the parliament and, uh, and also the, the council, uh, last week there, were, there was an agreement on the budget of the of the Creative Europe uh, program for the next period um, that will reach two billion four hundred forty two uh, to be two billion euros. This is um, a lot, a lot more. Um, this means that we go. Do you know the program is composed of three strands. One is media for the audiovisual sector, one is culture, and one is the cross sector. So the heritage sector can benefit mainly from the culture strand and the cross sector strand. There is also a part of uh, audiovisual heritage, but that means it's much more limited. So what really um, uh, is interesting for this sector is the culture strand. We we go from 428 million for the current period to 757. So it's, 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 a, it's a very big increase. I mean, it's around 70%. Um, this is a very good news. Uh, now the program, uh, so the legal base, uh, the, the, re the regulation setting the rules of the program needs to be adopted in parliament and the council. And then we will be ready to launch uh, uh, the, the next um, uh, call for proposals within the cooperation project in uh, the beginning of the next year. I can also give you a few details about uh, the cooperation projects and these calls, but I know if I'm exceeding the time I was allowed, if I can go through that. So, you have a minute. Okay, I can, I can go quickly through, through, through those uh, aspects. So the program, as I said, is a continuation of the existing program. It has three main novelties. One is that we have uh, an approach for sectors and the heritage sector will be one of the sectors including, included in the new program. So we have the cooperation projects and on top of that, we'll have some specific actions for sectors amongst them, the heritage. So this is something that needs to to be defined now. Another important aspect is mobility. Uh, for the first time, the program includes um, a specific action for individual mobility. Some people like to call it a very, in a very simplistic way, like Erasmus for culture. It's different because the culture is addressed to, will be addressed to professionals and it will allow individual mobility of professionals in any uh, of the cultural and creative sectors covered uh, by the program. Um, I wanted also, uh, uh, there is also an important novelty regarding the, the cooperation projects. Well, until now we have two, two types of projects, big and small. Now we'll have medium, big, medium and small. What does it mean? Now for the big projects, we are talking about projects for a grant of 2 million euros and uh, uh, a certain number of uh, partners. For the small, it's only three partners and maximum amount of the grant is 200,000. The median will be between the two. We, we don't have a, a final figure yes, uh, yet, but think about uh, between 700 and uh, 1 million. So it will give 
uh, an important opportunity to people that didn't fit into the big or the small project. And also a very important news that, um, or novelty that we'll, uh, we'll have the new program is that we will increase the co-financing uh, part of the project. So until now, you have to provide 50% in the big uh, projects and 40% uh, uh, in small. We will hope to go uh, well beyond that also in, this, in that spirit of, help, of helping the sector. So uh, now we are late. We are late because until we don't have the legal base approved in Parliament and Council, we cannot publish the first call for proposals for cooperation projects. So uh, on 7th of December, there is a trilogue, which is the, the, the name that is uh, very wrongly used to describe a dialogue between three parts, uh, um, the, the Council, the Parliament and the Commission, and this is where the negotiations uh, wrap up. So if we are lucky, uh, beginning of December, we will have a stable legal base, and then we can start working about publishing the call for proposals. But as you know, normally they are published between uh, September and November, and uh, this year they will never be published before January. So it will have a, a, certain, a certain delay, but we can, that we will compensate with uh, more funds and uh, well, with, a, with a return to normality, to, to normal uh, in 2022. So I believe from the moment being, uh, this is what I had to share with you. Of course, I'm here still if you have some questions or, or comments. Thank you very much, Mr. Velasquez. Uh, thanks for giving so many details as well about the new Creative Europe program. Uh, and for the, here, it's really good news to hear about the increase in, in budget as well. Um, before we go to the very numerous uh, questions from the audience, I just want to leave maybe 10 minutes uh, if any of the panelists wanted to react to uh, any of the other panelists' uh, interventions. Of course, uh, Jimmy, Ivan, and Josephine, you're also very welcome to, to react as well if you have anything to say or also anything to add. Um, just uh, go ahead and unmute yourselves and you can uh, you are free maybe you're all still thinking of questions uh, i can give you another minute it's fine <laughs> i had a first question um maybe Mr. Petro Velasquez and Franca Tome, could you, could one of you maybe uh, briefly describe to us um, and explain whether your two different directorate, directorate generals are, are working together and, um, and how? Because in the way that you, you both talked about the different programs, uh, it, it's not so obvious to me yet uh, how your two DGs work together. So I'm just curious if you can, uh, if you can explain that a little bit. Branka, do you want to go ahead? Yeah, you have to unmute yourself. Thanks. Uh, yes, thanks for this. Uh, thanks for this question. Uh, well, I can I can uh, only tell tell from my uh, let's say narrow perspective of geographical indications and traditional foods uh, because this is the area I'm involved in. Uh, so I'm, I'm pretty sure that other parts of uh, Directorate General for Agriculture have have uh, other contacts and they work uh, on other items together with uh, DG uh, EAC. But uh, I do remember uh, maybe uh, about one year, two years ago, there was a con communication that was prepared by um, the Director General of uh, uh, the Director General of Pedro, which was uh, exactly on, uh, on uh, food and on heritage in food and so on. So we were exchanging the documents, we were contributing to the documents, uh, preparing the document together. Uh, surely it, there were also other services that were involved, uh, because whenever a new policy initiative is prepared by a Directorate General, 
um, all the relevant directorates general are consulted and they get the draft and they contribute and there are meetings and we are discussing uh, together. Um, this, is, this is the way how we cooperate. Unfortunately, a bit less now in the meetings, it's more emails and papers, but, um, but uh, um, we do have uh, established, uh, let's say, uh, formal uh, networks so that uh, the relevant uh, services of the Commission have to be consulted and then we have obviously our informal contacts and uh, we, we look together at, uh, at uh, various uh, communications, legislation, uh, rules that will be or proposed or adopted. Yes. Thank you, Branka. Is there any other panelist that wants to um, react? Otherwise, in the meantime, I, we have another poll question that we can pull up as well. Okay. Do you think that our food heritage can contribute to achieving the environmental and social ambitions of the European Green Deal? Definitely, partly, or not at all? Okay. So yes, definitely, uh, which is a, a great news, of course. So we all have high hopes um, for for food heritage to contribute to both the environmental and the social ambitions of the European Green Deal. Thank you. Okay, so if there are no other uh, immediate reactions, we can turn to the questions from the audience because we have uh, many. So one of the first questions uh, that we have is, how does food and culture uh, have to do with the UNESCO 2005 Convention on Cultural Diversity and the 2003 Convention on the Protection of Intangible Cultural Heritage? I'm not sure who is the best person to answer this. Maybe Jimmy, if you know. Sorry to put you on the spot. I don't have specific uh, knowledge of uh, of these uh, of these uh, of the UNESCO and the, the the specific thing that you mean. I just maybe like to seize this opportunity to come back to one issue. I mean, I listened with a lot of uh, interest to <clears throat> what my uh, former colleagues uh, Branca and Pedro said, and um, I think there's a lot of hope in what we are doing, what we are saying here. I listened to Pedro's. Uh, uh, indications about the future of the creative uh, uh, Europe program and the opportunity that, uh, that, that are given. I listened to what Branka said about uh, and the expansion. I saw some of the other questions that I could have come up about how can we emphasize uh, these, uh, these the recognitions of the products and of the brands etc. So there's a lot of um, there's a lot of work uh, to do in in uh, what we are, what we are seeing, and these links that we have between our different uh, services have to come up and lead. And I would be happy today that um, in the more global uh, 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 narrative about where are we going with the EU, uh, we will have these elements fully integrated. And as I mentioned before, because it's not only about supporting programs, supporting people. It's also a more general thing about where we where are we going with this European project? How can how can we how can we design? How can you involve more the European citizens, including I mean the people that are working in uh, these areas? Uh, how can we involve them more? How can we better recognize? As Anna Francesca said, I mean this type of uh, you know uh, um, uh, initiatives because they are typically uh, initiatives where you start from a very local angle and you and uh, you know it, you want to bring it at a European level and this form of recognition so I think we are going in, into really the right direction and I learned some very positive things we can't answer all these questions now we can be very technical at, at this moment 
And I think uh, I was, I'm very pleased and was very pleased to follow this project with my colleague Manon for some time, but getting into this, and this is an essential thing. Uh, one last thing I mentioned during the, uh, uh, during uh, my, my little speech, I mean, and this is something really we have to pay attention to. And I think also it goes for Branca, it goes for Pedro, uh, this notion of well-being. Uh, this is an element that's going to come very more and more to the forefront. How can the EU help in promoting the well-being of its citizens? It's not through economic patterns. It's not through these types of solutions. It's something that will bring people uh, together. And it's much more inclusive. It's much more uh, global. But uh, what these questions, what a lot of the questions I saw reflect is exactly that. So how can we move together on this? And what can be the role of the EU? And the EU has a big role to play. Thank you so much. There's also another question, uh, slightly related, I would say, but um, someone is asking, how can we protect our food sources in the face of the new common agricultural policy? So how can we adequately measure the value to reflect its importance to so many aspects of our culture? Uh, and also the, the question about how do we balance the scales against the, the, the weight of the lobby of the intensive food production? I guess this question is either to, to Branka or, or Marta from, uh, from the NGO perspective. Um, so what can we do in the, in the face of the cap? I can start. Yeah, so in the face of the uh, common agricultural policy, what we can certainly do, um, first of all, right now as citizens is to put pressure on our governments. Our governments right now are also coming up with national strategic plans um, that are supposed to design indeed how the common agricultural policy will develop within each country. And by the way, we're going to have a conference next week on the 24th of November about this topic with some uh, national representatives as, as well from ministries and farmers of slow food. Um, but so it's important um, like to, to keep the pressure up because the thing is that the current uh, common agricultural policy offers a sort of menu of choices for governments to choose among the measures and the, among the objectives that they want to reach. So sustainability, there are some sustainability objectives, but uh, no one is obliged to essentially select those um, and work towards those. Um, so whilst negotiations are still happening, we as civil society are applying a lot of pressure to make sure that either there is a withdrawal of the CAP, common agricultural policy, or there is much higher ambition. Um, and here we're really talking about ambition in terms of um, uh, environmental sustainability, social sustainability, so fairness, fair treatment of farm workers and all farmers, um, but also in terms of, um, you know, like we were mentioning before, food biodiversity as the, from our point of view, link between nature and the work and the know-how of, of our society, essentially, and of our farmers. I'll keep it short. Uh, what I can add here to Marta, uh, indeed, um, national strategic plans, it is now the moment and it will be member states who will be, um, who are the ones who have to present national strategic plans and these plans will be for the next seven years. So it's very important that uh, now that member states are drafting them, that uh, your voice is heard and Marta explained how the voice of slow food uh, is heard and what uh, they are doing to 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 bring uh, the the values uh, and the needs uh, of slow food uh, members into this process. Um, maybe myself, from the perspective of geographical indications, I will repeat myself a little bit. Um, we are really uh, now at the start of the process of improving what we already have. And um, now in the roadmap um, that is now uh, open on the website for feedback, uh, we have uh, pointed uh, to several issues and to several objectives that we see for this uh, exercise. And uh, one of them is sustainability. Again, as Marta mentioned, environmental, social, economic sustainability of uh, farmers. Uh, one of the objectives or the issues is um, how to increase in attractiveness 
because uh, in case of geographical indications, uh, what we observe is that they are very popular in some member states. There are member states with um, very valued food tradition. But there are also countries in the European Union where there are not so many geographical indications, where, where they do not have, I mean, they, they, they surely have products, but they don't have this tradition, they don't maybe recognize what is in these products and that they need to be protected and that there are people be, behind it and that there, there, there is value added in, in those products and that one should bring it up and that there are at European level mechanisms to bring it up, uh, like the three that I mentioned, geographical indications, traditional specialities, guaranteed and mountain product. So, so we are um, starting a bit um, uh, a, um, a revival of what we have. We would like to make it better. We would like to make it uh, success, not only in some member states where we know it's already the, a big success. Th these type of products are already big success. They are known, people know about them. They are famous. But uh, we would like to make it, um, make it really uh, a European thing, a really um, um, a success so that every consumer will know, wow, this is the European logo geographical indication. It has product specification behind it. Um, uh, people who are do, uh, uh, dealing with this product, they respect what they have written in the product specification. Oh, okay, they are also controlled uh, and so on. But, but just to make, to, to increase this awareness. So this, this is what we would like. And here is where you can help us with ideas, with uh, describing your situations and so on. Thank you for, for these two answers. Um, I have another question that uh, again relates uh, more to agriculture. Uh, someone is asking, how big do you see the threat coming from the recent push of new GMOs, so genetically modified organisms in the EU to food heritage? And how useful are geographical indications as a potential world, uh, in a potential world of de deregulated GMOs? Um, can geographical indications help, uh, help this? I guess well, I, can, I can comment yeah. quickly on geographical indications. Uh, indeed, they can. How? The producers, the producers are at the roots. Um, Jimmy mentioned before, it comes from the bottom. It comes from those who are in the area who are producing. They are the ones to decide that they do not want GMO feed for their animals and then for the products that are coming from these animals. They can decide. And they write it in the product specification for that very product. And then they can, uh, they can um, uh, use uh, the funds that are available, for example, in rural development for, for support to information and pro promotion activities in their, uh, for their geographical indications. And they can, they can uh, inform and promote also in this way that not only it's a geographical indication coming from that area being a product with a story as, as, as I said but also to promote that their geographical indication is a GMO free. Yeah thank you that's a very important point and I would also add that this works probably very well with uh, the older generation of GMOs let's say the ones that, that we are already uh, that we already know about but indeed uh, the question here um, was also about the new wave of GMOs that currently uh, should be regulated like GMOs and uh, Slow Food um, advocates very strongly that this should remain the case uh, and it should remain the case because otherwise it will be possible for new te techniques of GMOs uh, to not be labeled as such and uh, this is where we see a risk that um, we might find GMOs in products that, uh, that we do not expect it to. So this is a, a bit of another question, but let's make sure that GMOs are, are labeled and that they are traceable. Um, okay, I have another question. We'll take a, another uh, one or two more, and then uh, we will close as we are uh, arriving to the end of the conference. Uh, food production and cultural landscapes, water heritage, are very much connected. 
uh, these relations can be used to support protection of food heritage through the protection plans for rural areas. Um, to, em to emphasize, this relation makes the argument stronger. Someone is asking uh, for their views, uh, so maybe this question is more to Pedro Velasquez or Jimmy Jamar. So the link between food production, cultural landscapes, and food heritage. Do either one of you want to take Sorry, the question? I, I didn't understand the one part of the question. Relation between food production, cultural heritage, and and what uh, la cultural landscapes and water heritage? Cultural landscape. Um, well, this is uh, this is uh, an excellent uh, question to to be answered by the three of us together because it touches every every single part. I believe that uh, I mean what I mentioned. I mean in related to, in relation to the crisis is uh, is uh, is important to understand these connections. We have seen how interdependent are. Um, the, the, the cultural landscape from uh, from uh, from an active uh, agriculture we see it in I mean the in the mountains uh, area especially that Branca mentioned we see the importance of maintaining the the value chain and for that the importance of uh, of uh, having an active cultural heritage policy but also um, also an active uh, tourist policy. So, I mean, there are uh, very, very uh, natural interdependencies and connections between the three aspects. And, and perhaps if my colleagues have something else to add, that I would be learning from them. <laughs> yeah, go ahead, Jimmy. Yeah. yeah, no, it shows, I think, exactly uh, what the question shows exactly, I would say, what you're talking about here. And this is the fact that. Uh, neither food nor heritage and, uh, as our sectors that we should uh, um, look into or the preservation of landscapes is, is, is reflected in the question. This is a holistic question. I mean, this is something that we have to approach uh, on a global, in a global way. And we feel very strongly through the questions that I saw in the question and answer or through the reactions that we have, uh, you know, through the chats that we have to approach all of this much less you know, as in, in, in isolation. Although, and, and this, is, this is very positive. I mean, um, um, this project, uh, Food is Culture, uh, uh, emanated from a Creative Europe, uh, you know, uh, uh, project, uh, which is, shows that we can, through individual programs, uh, EU programs, we can, we can enhance uh, this uh, more global view. But we have to bring this now to, I would say a more political, at a more political level, and at the highest, uh, uh, I would say, political level. This will take a lot of convincing, uh, but at some stage, uh, whether in our member states, whether in the institutions, we will have to look into, I mean, uh, the very essence of what will, in the future, bring citizens, European citizens, to believe in the European project. And they will have to find some answers, and some of the answers uh, linked to well-being, on the food that we eat, on the food that we produce, on the preservation of um, uh, our, our sort of the European, the European model, as uh, uh, Margarete Schina's uh, his portfolio has, and, and, and pre preservation and promotion of this model. So I think we are getting into developing a much uh, a more global narrative. And uh, what we heard this morning in the different interventions, bits by bits, provide, I would say, a, a real hope and a real uh, um, uh, indication of what also the, the people want, the citizen want, the, 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 the farmers that need uh, their areas to be, or their brands to be protected. So we have a lot of work to do, but we can only do it uh, through this type of project and by bringing the lessons of these projects uh, at a more global level. Thank you so much. Um, so it's 10 to 1. I have two last questions that I, I see from the chat that I would like to get some uh, maybe brief answers to. Uh, someone is asking to know more about the school contest uh, that was uh, mentioned at the beginning, uh, part of the Food is Culture project. 
and uh, whether it's still possible to participate. So I think both Paola and also Ivan, you, you mentioned these school contests. Um, maybe you could um, describe a little bit more how they how they worked. Uh, yeah, yeah, sure. Uh, well, actually, the the school contest is over, but nevertheless, uh, no, we uh, uh, the methodology that was developed uh, for this opportunity uh, uh, by the Slow Food actually is still available, and it's on our website. And uh, the whole uh, uh, we call it a school contest, but actually, it's a, it it was like a. Uh, a tool to promote to promote actually the idea of uh, uh, food as a cultural heritage. Uh, the idea was that uh, uh, pupils of uh, early the uh, uh, early like uh, fifth, uh, one to to fourth grade uh, attend these uh, uh, classes and they uh, uh, jointly uh, went through the whole uh, process of uh, uh, you know. Uh, of all, each element of uh, how how do we consider food to be a, a, a cultural heritage and in the end uh, the idea was that they collect uh, in their communities uh, from their grandparents grandparents and uh, fathers and mothers uh, this uh, food tales or stories about the food preparation about the uh, 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 food products or old recipes and in the end they uh, uh, actively participate uh, in this idea of uh, collecting uh, 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 these uh, food stories. Um, so uh, they send us their their uh, recipes. Some of them uh, were quite old. Some of them were not so. But the, the whole process were more important than I would say the final results. But uh, as I said, uh, the whole uh, methodology is available. So uh, we encourage each of these schools that they replicate the whole process again, even with the same uh, pupils. So. Thank you. If I may add very quickly, we developed a course for, uh, for schools, for uh, uh, teachers and, uh, and children, uh, which is available uh, in English. The title is uh, The Arc of Taste Goes to School. So uh, we encourage all those interested in uh, looking at the, on the website and uh, download it and ask for more information. Uh, the total schools um, involved were 36 in Croatia, Serbia, and Italy, uh, with more than 1,000 uh, school children participating. Thank you. Thank you, Paola. Uh, I see Jimmy, you want to uh, react? Yeah. yeah, just one element in that. Um, I really think that um, in developing, I would say, this. Um, this more global scheme, education is paramount. And I really was uh, very interested in, uh, uh, in the presentations, both by Josefina and Ivan, uh, this, this project of bringing, showing it to the people. One day we will get out of this, uh, this uh, virus crisis, I, I hope, and we will be able to, to, to resume, I would say, uh, some of the things uh, that we have launched. And I think what you have developed, both of you, in, uh, through this, um, through your projects, it's very, very, very important. The awareness raising, bringing citizens on board on these interests, some of the things that are absolutely fundamental for their for their uh, daily life, for their well-being, and for the future, is also creating the awareness. And the awareness you do through uh, in the education in the schools by bringing uh, by making people, young people, aware. And you will find, I think, a very good response on this, uh, uh, both by uh, the teachers, by the, the parents' associations, by the local authorities. I mean, this is what we have to do to create, I think, this, uh, this awareness. So thank you. I mean, these, these two projects were uh, really very interesting, I thought. Thank you, Jimmy. Before I wrap up, we're going to close with one final poll question, if we can have it uh, come up on the screen. And then we will also share some links in the chat with all of you for to some videos about the project because a lot of you are asking uh, for more details and links about the project. So we will send you more of those links. I don't know if it's possible. Okay, yes, we have the last final question. Do you feel proud of, uh, about uh, your food heritage? Yes, I could name dozens of amazing traditional products and foods. Or I don't know many or any examples of food heritage from my region. 
but I'm interested to discover more. Okay, let's see the final results. Great. It's good to see that uh, if not, if this wasn't the case already at the beginning of the conference, at least now uh, everyone is really aware what we mean by, by food heritage, which I don't think is necessarily an obvious term for everybody. Uh, but it's great to see that you are all very proud of the local food heritage from your region. So that, that's great to hear. Um, I want to thank everybody for, for joining uh, this conference. I hope that you learned a lot. I certainly uh, did, and it was really uh, great to, to have all of you uh, participate. Thank you to all of the, the panelists. Uh, I just have a couple of, uh, of notices to make, and then I will pass it on to Manon for uh, some concluding words. Uh, this event was part of uh, Terra Madre Salona del Gusto, which uh, usually takes place uh, over four days uh, physically in presence in uh, Torino in Italy uh, and this year we've had to be uh, we've had to improvise and so it means that you will all be able to participate in Terra Madre until April 2021 so ample time to join other conferences forums food talk uh, food tastings there's lots of things uh, lots of things going on so you can go and check out the Terra Madre website and also I ask you to please also consider making a donation so that we can continue doing the work that we do. We'd also like to hear uh, what you thought about this event. So we will uh, share here a very short survey. Uh, we ask you that to take just two minutes to, to answer a few questions. It's really important for us to uh, be able to evaluate also the impact that we are having. So you will receive the link here and um, yes I just want to thank again all of the panelists for for joining for the very interesting uh, interven interventions that you made and I pass it on to Manon uh, for some concluding words thank you Thank you, Madeleine. Uh, I also would like to thank uh, our speakers for their uh, sharing their most interesting insights with us today and also thank uh, our participants for their pertinent questions. I think that through our discussion today, we have all uh, demonstrated how important food heritage is to communities. It relates to our identity, our traditions, our well-being, and it fosters our sense of belonging to a larger European family. But we have also demonstrated that it can be an important asset for a more sustainable and inclusive Europe meaning that it should be central to Europe's green recovery. Today's exchanges in our um, EU policy brief can be useful tools to advocate for ambitious EU strategies and policies in this direction. This is only the beginning. We can achieve much more by joining forces and building a constructive dialogue with policymakers. And you can count on us for that. So it is now time to end our event. And on behalf of the project partners, many thanks again for your active participation. Follow us and we look forward to hopefully seeing you soon in person. Thank you very much, everyone. The future of our planet is decided at the table in our daily food choices. What do we know about what we eat? How do we choose? Where do we buy it? You can make a difference and contribute to a future where everyone has access to food that is good. Eating must be a pleasure for everyone. We all have a right to food that is healthy, natural, fresh, and seasonal. Clean. Being aware helps us to choose food that is good for our health and the health of our planet. Fair. Knowing our food means making choices that are fair to us, to the producers, and to future generations. Slow Food has been working for over 30 years to defend biodiversity and fight the climate crisis by promoting good, clean, and fair food for all. Slow 
our food. Let's act together for the common good. Go to donate.slowfood.com slash en. And follow us at terramadresalunadelgusta.com.